Okay, members, we will, we're going to begin here today. Um, it is Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. This is the Education uh, Finance Committee, and I am calling it to order. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind members that we do have a Thursday evening hearing starting at 6 p.m. where we will be hearing the hourly unemployment bill. So um, I just wanted to remind you, so you've got that on your schedule, and it's Senate File 32. Um, we also, as we are getting closer and closer to deadlines, will be hearing more bills, um, and so I just want you to be aware of that and um, prepare yourself for some, you know, really good discussion, but we will be moving uh, in a more concentrated manner. This morning, we're going to hear, I'm going to um, uh, present my obsolete general education transition bill, and then we'll hear from Senator Champion and Senator Bolden. Uh, and so I am going to turn the gavel over to my um, uh, um, assistant chair, uh, Senator Gustafson, and I am going to go present my bill. Thank you, Senator Kunish. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, members, I would like to um, present to you Senate File 1307. Um, all this does is it eliminates any obsolete general education transition and it, transition aid date, and it removes references to fiscal years 24 and 25. Oh, I'm sorry, 2004-2005. Any questions, members? Motion to move Senate file 1307 to the floor. Thank you very much. All those who say, all those aye, or all those in agreement say aye. Aye. Those in disagreement say nay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, welcome, Senator, uh, Senator Champion. Before you uh, introduce your bill, do you have an amendment? Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and the rest of the committee. Uh, thank you so much for hearing uh, Senate File 1329. And Madam Chair, to your specific question, yes, we do have an A1 amendment that we'd ask for someone to move in order to get the bill in the shape and order that uh, I would like. Senator Swadzinski, would you make that movement? So Motion. Thank you. So move. Thank you. You may begin um, the, um, would you just briefly describe your amendment? Uh, so, Madam Chair, so the Senate File 1329 uh, uh, is going to have two components to it once, once this committee adopts the A1 amendment, and we know that it's been moved, and we'll wait for the uh, committee to adopt the A1 amendment. But the A1 amendment just adds on the online music instruction grant. Um, um, as you know, as the Senate file currently sits, we have the learning with music component, but we wanted to make sure that we added the online school partnerships grant. And just so you know, uh, my testifier will talk about the purpose of the online music 
uh, education bill is it, to provide access to music for education throughout Minnesota using online technologies. Uh, and we know that right now, if you're in rural Minnesota, you may not have the opportunity or the option to come down to the cities and take advantage of the uh, physical space of McPhail, but that learning and instruction uh, will get to those students through technology. And what a great option and, and opportunity for um, kids to get the benefit of the learning, uh, and the expertise of McPhail, because we know that when kids uh, are involved in, I often say pro-social activities, but even learning music, it helps them academically, and, 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 and there's that nexus between academics and art and music and, and uh, academics. So um, that is what the A1 Amendment will do, will provide grants, and then you will also hear from my testifiers who can talk much more eloquently about this uh, uh, online educational uh, opportunity than I can. But that is what it does, and if the committee was so adopted, then we can talk more about this wonderful work at McPhail. Thank you so much for um, that explanation. Um, so we'll just move to a voice vote on adopting the A1. All members in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion um, is adopted. So um, would you like to then go on to your bill and explain to us about your bill, Senator Champion? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you again, committee. Um, as I started talking about the overall benefits of music and how it benefits not just young people, but our seniors as well. But, but we are talking about today learning with music and learning uh, with music uh, program is an amazing program with evidence-based results demonstrating dramatic gains for our youngest learners in their school readiness skills. Uh, there's a longitudinal study that was conducted um, over a three-year period, and, and it's my understanding that it shows 150% greater growth in children's uh, uh, control and their ability to uh, learn and grow, and this research study has been published by the Early Childhood Research Quarterly. So with that, I do have a testifier who is going to talk more about the learning with music component. Um, and then after that, I'll talk a little bit about online partnerships. And, and I have a testifier who will cover that uh, portion of testimony. Thank you, Senator Champion. Um, I believe it's Diana Babcock. Yes. Thank you. If you would please state your name for the record, and then you may begin your testimony. All right. My name is Diana Babcock. And um, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm looking forward to talking about Learning with Music. So um, Learning with Music is a program that was developed back in 2004. And it was based on um, actually some experience that I had myself as an early childhood educator prior to that, noticing that um, it wasn't very common for early childhood educators to integrate music beyond the group time. And um, that is important, but there is so many other benefits of using music throughout the day um, in learning opportunities. And so um, we tested this at several locations and did um, about 20 years worth of informal research, formal and informal research on the impact of music and integrating it throughout the school day. Um, as a music educator, I also knew the benefits of music in enhancing um, brain development, um, it's one of the few things that activities that uses both sides of the brain. And, um, and then also, then you see um, attention, you can get their attention, they can build their social emotional skills with music, um, cognitive, creative language, you name it, 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 it does everything. And so with the research, we started in 2013, we had a formal research project with Eleanor Brown from Westchester University. And what we focused on was integrating music into economically disadvantaged um, preschools, which we had been doing prior to that. Our focus was on really helping those students that were living in economically disadvantaged or hardship um, situations. And so um, over a three-year research project, we found a 150% increase in the student's emotion regulation and impulse control, just with the integration of music throughout the day. Um, the uniqueness of the program is that we're actually not, our plan is not to be there forever. Our plan is to train and coach early childhood educators how to use music throughout the day. 
um, so that they can then do that. And, and our, our hope is that they will integrate it into their culture. And that's where we see the difference is when it becomes a part of the teaching approach and culture. And so what we're hoping to do uh, with next steps with the program, now that we have these amazing research results, um, is to develop um, training programs and coaching settings for early childhood educators to be able to learn how to integrate music um, more effectively throughout the day, um, then deliver those in both in-person and online modules just you know, and a variety of ways that we're we're going to um, work with um, our advisory committee to develop what is the best route, and then also to expand the program to work with more preschools and more students. The hope is that um, students will be ready for school, because that is something we notice at, um, especially in the settings that we've been working in, that um, those children that are experiencing those extra stressors are not always ready for school, and music will be the um, equalizer to help them get there through the training of teachers. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Babcock. Any questions for Ms. Babcock? And Madam Chair? Oh, Senator. And if I can just support everything that uh, my testifier has talked about, uh, I have um, uh, a personal connection not only to McPhail, but the but the notion of music, um, uh, being one who started not at McPhill, but learning how to play piano in, uh, early on, uh, it allowed me at 13 to start a choir that became a Grammy-nominated and still award-winning choir. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my sons, uh, both Jalen, uh, who is in school in Colorado, he started off you know, playing piano and learning piano at McPhail, but also uh, he decided that he was gonna play the baritone uh, in the school band, and he's been doing that and did that all through high school. And then my son, Miles, who, who opted to you know, play violin uh, and then also take piano at McPhail. The whole reason for me sharing those personal stories is not to gloat, but is to say <laughs> that I understand the nexus between how students can perform academically if you give them an opportunity to learn to read, and it helps in, in, in math and all the other uh, connections. And so uh, I just hope that this uh, committee sees the value of that. And now um, we know that that's where they can physically be in those partnerships. But now the second component is the online partnerships, as I started talking earlier about how uh, this expertise and this learning uh, at McPhail can be shared with our rural communities through technology. And so I do have a testifier who can uh, talk about that if you so allow, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and, and um, thanks for sharing all that, that good information. That's, I wouldn't call it gloating. I would say, you know, giving, um, giving um, due where it's, where it's certainly due, and um, congratulations very late in the game on, on your Grammy. Uh, I believe we have Elizabeth Winslow here. Yes. Would you please state your name for the record, and then you may begin. Elizabeth Winslow. Um, greetings, Madam Chair and members. My name is Elizabeth Winslow. I'm the Director of School Partnerships at McPhail Center for Music, which encompasses our online school partnership program. Uh, prior to this, I spent a dozen years teaching band in public schools. And I'm here today to share why supporting online school partnerships in this bill is crucial for today's students. We ask a lot of our educators, and especially our music educators. My first full-time teaching job was in New Fold in Minnesota, about 17 miles north of Thief River Falls. This job, in my 22 years, I was ready to go, entailed elementary band, elementary band lessons, junior high band, senior high band, junior high choir, senior high choir, pep band at all home games, and jazz band. I had just graduated with a degree in instrumental music and hadn't sung in a choir since high school. The entire music ensemble experience for the entire of Marshall County for grades four through 12 rested just on me. These are the types of situations that we at McPhail Center for Music support in Greater Minnesota and Title I schools. We provide accessible online low-cost lessons, sectionals, and classes at a steeply discounted rate. In affluent and metro area school programs, bringing in teaching artists for a residency, having more than one music director, and offering a private lesson program during the school day are commonplace. But this is rare in Title I and Greater Minnesota schools. We are disrupting that inequality by bringing our exceptionally talented and passionate faculty into classrooms virtually to support the already incredible efforts of Minnesota's E12 teachers. 
This past year through online school partnerships, we've taught everything from music to in early childhood classrooms in partnership with Diana, uh, to all state audition preparation, choir sectionals, sectionals, and electronic music production. We partner with Wilder Research every year to you know, check in on our effectiveness. And I want to point out two statistics from our 2022 report, which are listed on that one page, the back of that one page document you have about um, online school partnerships. Um, we have a lot of data, but these two, as an educator, really stood out to me. 88% of the students that we worked with last year reported that participated in, or participation in OSP resulted in increased motivation to participate in school music ensembles, as well as increased motivation to do well on their instrument. 67% of our participants report that OSP had a positive impact on their mental health and made them more excited to come to school. I have yet to come across a teacher of any subject this year or last year who hasn't said that disruptions from the pandemic deeply impacted student behavior, engagement, motivation. And in that landscape, positive data that students are excited to come to school is powerfully compelling. Through access to high quality online experiences with McPhail, we can help reach students who may need a reason to engage with school. Thank you for your time and your support of students in Minnesota. And Madam Chair. Uh, Senator. Uh, lastly, you know what uh, my two testifiers failed to cover? In, in all the eloquence, they failed to cover how patient they are with our students. Mm. <laughs> Have you heard those students when they first start learning to play an instrument? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what we have to endure when we're sitting in the audience? And the patience of these teachers to still see their potential and still smile at the end of the evening? When we are thinking, oh my God, <laughs> what's going on here? But over time, we see their patience pay off and their ability to see the potential in, our stud in the students and in our children, where then they get into the latter years of high school and we're sitting there going, oh my God, there's something so beautiful. That is what they're not talking about. And that is what also should be appreciated is their patience and their ability to see the potential in our students and in our children. And so, if nothing else, thank you for the opportunity to um, present this wonderful bill and this wonderful opportunity where we can see uh, the value in um, the learning, but also in access for all of our students and, and all of our children. So, with that, we'll stand for any additional questions uh, uh, and now we have a new chair. Hey, <laughs> Senator Gustafson, Chair Gustafson. I'm going to do better this time. Thank you, <laughs> Senator Champion. Um, I just want to just start out with the first comment, if that's okay. Um, I this uh, program, the McPhail Center for Music, has a has a big connection and partnership with White Bear Lake yes. um, in my district, and I know they do really good work there. And also just to say that my daughters play viola and I know about those early days and they are, <laughs> they are pretty, that, that's, they're good, they're, uh, they're interesting. Um, all right, members, questions? Senator Westland. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Champion. As we discussed before the hearing began, um, music education is near and dear to my heart. I've spoken about my younger son who um, was on an IEP um, from early childhood on. And um, music education and his ability to participate uh, and learn to play piano and to um, explore singing helped him um, become who he is. And as you mentioned, Ms. Babcock, music um, activates all parts of the brain. It, it integrates things. It helps create neural pathways. We know that um, music therapy for people who have experienced traumatic brain injuries, like it there's something magical about music. Um, but what it did for my son, my son would have a very difficult time having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. He's a little bit of an introvert, and it's just, it's hard for him. But my kid got to high school, and he performed playing the piano and singing in every single pep fest. Oh. Like, this kid was completely different. And it was because music helped him transform it helped him find something that he was really good at, it turns out. And every kid should have the opportunity. Music um, brings joy to people's lives. And if we can start early on in the path, kids may discover, parents may discover, that their kids have a love and a talent for this that they can then carry through with them for the rest of their life. So um, 
my, I hope this is not controversial. It's a very small investment we're being asked to make so we can train um, this to be incorporated into our schools. But it, it's magical and it transforms lives. Thank you, Senator Westland. Anyone else? All right, closing comments. Oh, we have some, Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just for the record, Ms. Winslow, can you go through those first year list of preps you had? Yeah. And if you don't mind sharing, I'd like to know what your um, contract pay was for all those preps that you had during that first year of teaching. Yeah, so Madam Chair and Senator, you're asking the specific things that I was teaching that first year, or? That list of preps you already read, I'm just in awe of first year teachers in greater Minnesota that get the task of six or seven preps and the amount of, for, and the hard work that they do in programs such as your, your um, with the compensation oh, that they you. receive. So um, thank you for what you did that. That was your first year, correct? That was my first year with my full Yeah, first if you could just job, read those, yeah. that list of subjects you had to. Um, sure, I can read that again. Um, it's, sorry, um, <laughs> Madam Chair. Um, Madam um, Chair. Not that you had to teach, that you got to I teach. I got to teach. <laughs> You would like me to read that again? Um, elementary band, elementary band lessons, uh, junior high band, senior high band, junior high choir, senior high choir, pep band at all home games, uh, very sports focused school, and jazz band. Um, like you said, I got to teach it. I really, actually, really enjoyed the job. It was just a lot for one person. And um, we're actually in talks with the school, uh, the new director now to get online school partnerships um, with them. He's really excited. Just like me, he's more of a band person than a choir person. And so we're working with them and they're scheduled to have choir coaching for him and for his students. So um, it's just really nice to bring that full circle that um, I know exactly what that teacher is going through and we can support them with McPhail. So thank you. Senator Swazinski, anything else? Okay. All right. Seeing no further questions, um, you know, Chair Cha well, sorry, <laughs> Senator Champion, um, if you have any final thoughts, otherwise we will move this over to possible inclusion. Uh, final thoughts is again, this is a great program and I can't uh, celebrate it enough. In fact, it's so important that my um, uh, executive assistant to the president is with me because her daughter is participating at um, uh, in one of the programs at McPhail, and she's constantly telling me, although I know this already, and she thinks she's telling me something I don't already know how great the program is, how wonderful the program is. So uh, this introduction to music in many different ways allows kids to uh, be introduced to music as a whole, but various genres of music. In fact, one of my favorite classical pieces is Rhapsody in Blue by Gershwin, you know, and that was because of exposure to music. So thank you so very much, and this is a great investment for our children and to support the teachers who are doing great and patient and insightful work. So thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to speak. Senator Swazinski, do you make a motion to include this impossible? Possible inclusion? So moved. Thank you. All right, thank you. With that, we'll move to SF1036. And you may begin when you're ready. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. I am grateful to be before you this morning to present Senate File 1036, uh, which makes several changes uh, to allow the Head Start programs more opportunities uh, to expand programming and serve families in need. So a little bit about Head Start and Early Head Start. Uh, they are programs that serve Minnesota's 87 counties with comprehensive early childhood and family development services to families living at or below federal poverty um, from prenatal to age five. And we know investments in early childhood are some of the best investments we can make. Um, those, those first three years, um, investments there pay dividends for generations to come. And so the early Head Start and Head Start uh, programs produce great outcomes uh, in getting kids ready for school and school readiness success. 
Head Start programs still, however, have too many eligible families currently on waiting lists, and there's increasing need to serve uh, more children from birth to age three. These programs are struggling to serve more children, um, often because of lack of age-appropriate space, workforce challenges, equipment issues, and challenges around family transportation to and from the program. Staffing shortages and lack of space are the main contributors, contributors to the program's lack of capacity to provide these Head Start services. So expanding the eligible uses of Head Start funds will help these programs um, address some of the challenges. So this bill does a couple of things. It increases the appropriation for Head Start by $10 million each year uh, for the 24-25 biennium. It expands the allowable uses of state funds for Head Start, and early head, including Early Head Start, to support program operations, building, build infrastructure, support staff development, compensation and retention, and to reconfigure facilities. Um, and it dedicates 10.72% uh, of the annual Head Start allocation to tribal Head Start programs. And this was also included in the governor's budget. And so, um, Madam Chair and members, I, we have a couple of testifiers and then happy to have discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Our first testifier is Sandy Seimer, who is joining us online. You may begin when you're ready. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, we're honored to be here with you today. My name is Sandra Seimer, and I'm the Head Start Director at Families First in Rochester. And as Senator Bolton um, stated, Head Start is a comprehensive child and family development program, and we're serving the most at-risk children in our state. So to be eligible for Head Start, a family needs to be at or below 100% of the federal poverty line, which is $27,750, for a family of four, or be in foster care, be experiencing homelessness, or receiving TANF-funded services, including SNAP benefits. So Head Start works with both the child and the parents to support pregnant mothers, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers in various models that meet our federal Head Start performance standards. So no matter where a child is being served with Head Start, whether it's Alaska, Minnesota, or Puerto Rico, um, we all have the same federal um, performance standards, but we all within those performance standards have a lot of opportunity to be flexible in order to meet the needs of our unique communities. So we're currently serving 514 children and their families in the service areas of Olmsted and Freeborn counties. And I'm just proud to say that we've been open for in-person classrooms since July 6th of 2020. And I am just so grateful for staff who are really committed to meet the needs of children and families and to provide these services along with other additional supports for families, including food support and necessity support um, during, our, during our COVID time. The majority of our um, program is full day center-based services because this is what our parents said they really wanted and needed. So when I first started in Head Start many years ago, 32 years ago, it was primarily home-based with some center-based, maybe part-day classrooms. But between research, which shows the importance of dosage and fam families telling us what they really needed, um, we've really um, converted a lot of our Head Start and early Head Start programming to full-day center-based care. Yes, even for infants and toddlers. And our biggest waiting list is for toddlers, center-based care. So this is what, um, so over 50% of the children that we um, serve, um, English is not their <laughs> home language. And we have home visitors on staff who speak the primary languages for, um, for our center-based families and also our early Head Start home-based program. Most of our children receive transportation. We found transportation was a real barrier for access to the program in order to meet the most at-risk families. And health, um, including mental health and oral health are vital components of our programming. Uh, we're required through our standards to assert that our children are meeting the EPSDT, the early periodic screening diagnosis and treatment requirements for our state. So that means up to date on well child visits, dental visits, immunizations, screenings, to really make sure that our children not only have the support they need um, for school readiness, but also health. And um, so we're, um, 
we're also required to do any follow-up that's needed as that has been identified in any of the, of the um, exams. A real important part about Head Start is that we use data for decision making. Um, child assessment data is used for all children from infants through preschool to individualize strategies to support children's optimal progress across all school readiness domains. And we also use that child assessment data in working with the Minnesota Head Start Association who has been collecting child assessment data and analyzing it for over 10 years. Um, we also use that data for the past five years. A researcher works with the data to uh, determine a trajectory based on child's fall and winter um, assessment data to see where they would be in the spring. So that when those children who are age eligible for kindergarten, um, the ones that are the least likely to meet the spring benchmarks, we're given that list and we offer them summer school, intensive summer school, which really helps give an additional boost for that progress. And um, in, in all, even though we're serving 514 children and families, we have wait lists of families wanting their children in center-based infant, toddler, and preschool classrooms. We have 99 children on the wait list for Head Start and 138 infants and toddlers on the wait list for Early Head Start. So, um, it's really important for us to be able to serve the children during this window of opportunity that we have for them to really optimize their progress to be prepared for, for um, school and for life. And I just wanna to say too that parents are such a huge pillar of Head Start. We're so excited to have a parent who's also gonna be able to provide information today. And I just wanna tell you a short story. When I first started in Head Start, I was a teacher and um, I had a boy in my class who was selective, he had selective mutism. So he would not speak in class and he was screened and referred and early childhood special ed services were delivered to him. And he got the, him and his family got the support they needed in order for him to make progress. That child invited me to his wedding. At that wedding, he sang in front of the whole group to his wife. And it was such um, a huge moment for me to know that Although we had a lot of other support through the years, that early beginning is just so critical for children's success. So thank you um, for allowing me to speak. I think I want to thank, um, thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, that was a wonderful story. Our next testifier is also online. It is Amanda Maida. Please state your name for the record. Correct me if I pronounced it wrong, and you may begin when you are ready. Members, um, it's Amanda Fonta, um, but Mita is fine. Um, as Sandy said, I am um, a parent to a child or two children who are um, involved in Family First Head Start. I have one in Head Start and one in Early Head Start. Um, we have used those services for all four of my children, and it has been wonderful. Um, we have home visitors that come and help with, you know, anything from using um, conscious discipline to teething to potty training, and they give you pointers and help um, with different ideas depending on the child. And we have a wonderful home worker um, who my kids adore, and it is something that they look forward to. They don't only have; it's not just. Um, paperwork and things like that. They actually interact with the children and they, they love it. Um, we count on Head Start, early Head Start um, for guidance as parents. And it's some, it's like a whole nother family for us. We know the other families that are in the program um, and it's easy to plan activities with them so that you feel you're not alone. Um, there's lots of guidance. There's lots of people who um, can put you in the right direction or give you the resources that you need to be put in the right direction. Um, myself specifically, I am on the policy council as well, um, which is really nice because I get to see the other portion of it, not only as the parent, but also as somebody who is helping make decisions for our children. Um, 
I, this is my third year on the policy council and it's nice to see what we are doing, making the impact that is making the impact on these children. There are multiple surveys, um, as like Sandy said, that we can see over time kids who are in this program have significant improvements um, if they need help in a certain area. Um, one thing that we do review monthly on policy council is um, how many kids are enrolled. And it is a big thing down here, at least in Rochester, where we have in the surrounding areas where we have kids who um, don't have places to go because there is such a long waiting list. Um, and they, there's just not enough room, there's not enough staff. Um, more funding would be able to help help out in those areas. Um, it is a wonderful program and I wouldn't choose to have my kids anywhere else um, except Head Start and Early Head Start. We have, we've used them for our early um, three-year uh, screenings. Uh, and when you start that early, you can, you can get a grasp on certain things that they need help with if they need that. And Early Head Start has been wonderful in helping with those things for my children personally. Um, I feel my kids have a head start, exactly, um, on other kids that don't get into these services. They are wonderful. And I feel that they, when they go to community garden or um, get ready to leave the program, they are more than well prepared. That is all I have to say. <laughs> you did great. Thank you so much. Our final testifier is in person. It's Mr. Uni from the Minnesota Department of Education. You can begin when you're ready. Good morning, Madam Chair. Committee members, my name is Adosh Uni. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. And we're happy to provide support for a couple of the proposals in uh, Senator Bolden's bill, uh, specifically the set aside for tribal Head Start programs, as well as the expanded uses for Head Start programming. And these are proposals that are also in the governor's budget bill. Head Start and early Head Start programs play an important role for many children from low income families when it comes to school readiness, early learning and health and family well being. The children served by these programs benefit greatly from them, and we believe it's important that we support the program's ability to accomplish this. Currently, Minnesota statute distributes Head Start funding across all programs proportionally based on the federal allocation, and this means that when there are changes in federal funding allocations, it impacts all programs' share of the state Head Start funds. As he federal Head Start investments have increased over the past few years, with a greater proportional share of those increased funds going to non-tribal programs, Many tribal Head Start programs have experienced reduced state funding allocations. As you can imagine, when funding is unpredictable or decreases, it can be difficult for programs to manage and can inhibit program growth. This proposal to modify the funding formula will provide more consistent state allocations for the state's eight tribal programs from year to year and is critical to supporting their long-term success. Ensuring more consistent funding allocations supports these programs' stability and provides them with the ability to increase enrollment and serve additional children and thus carry out the important work that they do. Similarly, uh, similarly, providing more flexibility in how state funds are used will allow programs to increase capacity over time. Current requirements are that state funds be used to directly serve additional children. However, we have heard from programs that there are barriers to serving additional children related to space, workforce challenges, equipment issues, and family transportation challenges that current requirements on funds on fund use do not allow them to address. Allowing the use of state funds to support program operations and infrastructure will not only support increasing the program capacity of Head Start programs over time so that they can serve more children across the state and allow programs to make investments that are responsive to their individual community needs, but will also build the type of needed supports such as staffing, or transportation that promote access for families and better outcomes for children. Again, thank you for the opportunity to provide support for these important provisions in Senator Bolden's SF 1036. Thank you. Members, any questions? Senator McQuaid. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and this is more of a comment for you, Senator Bolden, but I um, love Head Start, Early Head Start. Obviously the data, I mean, this program's been around for a long time and the data really shows um, how beneficial it is. And the one thing I would say is I think this is what like we should all have. <laughs> I mean, I and I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about, I'm looking at this, you saw my jaw drop when it was like 100% of the federal poverty level, which is $23,000 a year for a family of three. Um, I'm just wondering like who are we missing between, like if you have two kids, that's $23,000 is probably the cost of childcare, right? So between that amount and then how much you'd have to be able to make to actually send your kids to daycare, like who are we missing in between, do you know? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator McQuay. That's an excellent question. Um, I don't have a specific number for you, but I think the answer is a lot of folks, a lot of families, a lot of kids. There are definitely gaps there. And, um, you know, that is also work that we need to be doing is to close that gap and to be sure that every family has the care and early learning that they need. Because, again, we know that those investments in those early years is the, is the foundation for outcomes, you know, education outcomes and health outcomes and um, many other outcomes uh, throughout their lives. And so setting kids up to succeed and families in those early years is critical. And so um, th there are gaps there um, between that 100% of fed uh, federal poverty guideline and folks who, you know, you, just as you said, the, the cost of childcare is giant and you know folks often pay more than their mortgage as much as college tuition um, and so there's a lot of families that are that are squeezed and, and in that middle ground so I think there's that's other work for us to be doing thank you all right anyone else all right Senator May Queen renews her motion to put this over into a possible omnibus inclusion and we thank you for your time thank you madam chair and committee members and with that, members, we're adjourned. Enjoy your extra hour. <laughs>